At the end of all of this, though, what they tell you is your ultimate reward is to cease to exist, that your Atman merges, the wave of your Atman merges with the sea of Brahman, and you become one with everything, and your own individual existence absolutely ceases to be. And it's like, what? wait, what? That was Leslie Kamenoff, and I'm Henry Winslow. You're listening to Dharma Talk. Hey, Dharma Talkers. In case you didn't catch my announcement last week, I want to give you fair warning that we are reaching the end of this podcast series. I'll be concluding the show with the highly auspicious episode 108. And that means just three more episodes remain after this week. So thank you all for being here through the finish line. Another timely announcement before we get into it. As of this recording, much of the US and many other countries are in either shelter in place or bona fide lockdown mode to curb the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic. Yoga studios, as with most small businesses, had been put in the difficult position of having to shut their doors temporarily. So two things, if you're a member of a local yoga studio and you have the financial means to do so, please resist freezing your membership and keep supporting your communities. Your yoga studio owner isn't in it for the money, I can guarantee it. And this is a powerful way for you to continue showing up for the people that have supported you. Secondly, I'm here for you with the Henry Yoga app if you need some assistance with your home practice during this time. I've got a number of free entry points into the app. There's a 60 minute masterclass and two 40 minute sessions straight out of the app curriculum that you can take for free. And we're offering a discounted price on the full program given the circumstances. Enter the discount code home practice, no space, one word, at checkout to get lifetime access to the full Henry Yoga app for just $25. You can take advantage of this offer at henryyoga.com. Now, let me pose a question. What exactly are we striving for when we strive to land a yoga pose? I'm not asking about a grandiose vision of the purpose of yoga. I'm talking specifically about putting your body into postures. Is there an ideal shape for any given asana? What does perfect look like? Does such a thing as the quote full expression end quote even exist? And if so, how do we map an archetype onto a specific body? This week, I'm talking with Leslie Kamenoff. If you are a certified yoga teacher, chances are pretty high that you'll recognize his name from the anatomy text in your teacher training. He quite literally wrote the book on yoga anatomy, although he'll sheepishly downplay his contribution in this conversation. But before Leslie became the go-to educator for yoga anatomy, he was a dedicated student of TKV Desika Char the son of Krishnamacharya and resolutely non-guru teacher of yoga therapy, a sort of individualized system of yoga prescriptions to help people reduce suffering. Leslie was already named a Swami at age 23, a piece of trivia he scoffs at now, before moving away from his ashram leanings and turning to a more adaptable and pragmatic approach to yoga for healing and understanding. It was with Desikachar that Leslie learned to inquire within for answers, and he passed that trust in the authority of oneself onto his students in kind. We'll get into his whole story, his philosophical ruminations, and some key takeaways for any yoga practitioner or teacher in just a few. But first, let's take a minute to thank our sponsors. This episode is brought to you in part by Warrior Bridge NYC. Warrior Bridge is an interdisciplinary movement studio in downtown Manhattan, offering classes in yoga, acro yoga, handstands, and flexibility training. Their classes are skillfully designed, featuring anatomy-informed warm-ups and progressions, drawing from and blending different yoga and movement modalities. 
While the offerings are diverse, what's constant is an emphasis on practicing in a way that honors where you're coming from and where you're trying to go. Warrior Bridge offers a full schedule of weekly classes, weekend workshops with visiting instructors, and teacher training programs, the next wave of which will be held this summer in NYC. First up, anatomy and movement teacher training from July 15th to 25th, led by Sean Langhouse and Emily Lazinski. Sean was a past guest on Dharma Talk, of course. This training is designed for both practicing and aspiring teachers who want to better understand anatomy and how the body works, as well as Warrior Bridge's unique training methodology around yoga, handstand, flexibility training, prehab, and injury prevention. And the next training will be their Acro Warrior Teacher Training from July 27th to August 6th. This is New York City's only Acro Yoga Teacher Training and is all about immersing yourself in the Acro practice and acquiring the skills to safely and intelligently lead Acro Yoga classes and practice. Learn more and register at warriorbridge.com. This episode is brought to you in part by Rainbow Mushrooms. Now more than ever, it's mission critical to stay on top of your immune system. We have a pandemic on our hands, and staying healthy is no longer just about you. It's a public health consideration as we try to flatten the proverbial curve well before our hospitals reach max capacity. Now, apart from proper diet, exercise, and getting a full night's sleep, I believe one of the best ways to boost your immune health is through supplementing with adaptogens specifically medicinal mushrooms. Enter rainbow. I've been taking rainbow mushrooms 1111 tincture for close to a year now with my daily morning brew. Also chock full of ground mushrooms. I'm on the double duty. So what is it? 1111 is a supplement that you take with a dropper, either mixed into a beverage or just straight into your mouth with 11 different medicinal mushrooms, all dual extracted to get the maximum benefit to your immuno health and cognitive function. And if maple syrup seems more appealing than a tincture, then you can get their newer product, Forest Juice, also loaded with fungi, and use it as a sweetener or take it by the shot. Head to rainbow.com and enter code HENRYWINS to get 15% off your order. Now back to the show. To introduce my guest, Leslie Kamenoff, at leslie.kamenoff on Instagram, co-author of the best-selling book, Yoga Anatomy, and creator of yogaanatomy.net, is a yoga educator and internationally recognized specialist with over four decades experience in the fields of yoga, breath, anatomy, and body work. His approach to teaching combines intellectual rigor, spontaneity, and humor, and is always evolving. If this conversation speaks to you and you'd like to know more about what Leslie is offering, then go to dharmatalk.show and type Leslie in the search bar, L-E-S-L-I-E, and you'll find all the notes there, highlights of the conversation with timestamps, and the links for this episode. And if you're looking for something to read, well, I recommend Leslie's book, Yoga Anatomy, And you can also find his own recommended book, as well as every other recommended book from the entire canon of Dharma Talk Conversations at henrywins.com slash books. So go there and pick one out. And now without further ado, please enjoy my interview with Leslie Kamenoff. Leslie, welcome to the show. I'm so happy to have you on here during our mutual self-imposed quarantine for the coronavirus. So thanks for making time to talk to me today. How are you? I'm good. That's going to automatically put a kind of a historic date stamp on this conversation, isn't it? It sure is. But hopefully the rest of the content of the conversation will be more timeless. But just to ground (laughs) everyone, yes, we are speaking on Monday, March 16th, after Los Angeles, which is where I'm speaking from, has just announced, the mayor of Los Angeles announced a um, citywide closure of almost all businesses. Where are you, Leslie? I'm in uh, New York City on the uh, Upper West Side of Manhattan. And um, yeah, I just got back from a month of traveling and teaching in Australia and all our flights connected through Hong Kong. So that was a no-brainer for us to lay low for a couple of weeks after getting home from that. 
Yeah. Even if you are feeling healthy, it's now become a definitely a pu- public health concern and we're all trying to flatten the curve here. Absolutely. You know, you could be walking around completely asymptomatic and be passing this thing along. So it's really in everyone's best interest to minimize contact. And for those who are concerned listening along, of course, this conversation is being held virtually over uh, internet. So the virus cannot spread through our microphones. Okay, yeah. let's uh, let's dive straight into it. Uh, I always open these conversations with the same first question, and I'd love to hear your answer to that. The question is, what does the word dharma mean to you? And what is your dharma as you understand it today? Hmm. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting way to open because um, for someone like me that uh, has been doing this for 40 plus years, this meaning uh, being a yoga educator, um, it brings up for me like the first time I heard that word and had it defined for me, which was very much in a traditional context of living at an ashram and receiving my teachings there. And, and then sort of reconsidering and redefining so, mu- so much of that when I took up my studies with uh, TKV Desikachar uh, nearly 10 years after that uh, in 1988. Um, so rather than giving a traditional translation uh, from the Sanskrit of, you know, that which upholds and all the stuff we get from the Gita and so on, um, I'll just share... Uh, some of my, I would say, contemplations on on what that term means on a very practical uh, level in real life. And I think of it a lot, actually. Um, For example, when I'm crossing the street here in New York in a crosswalk and there's a car waiting at the light, um, and I think of that, and I think of when I'm the person in the car with my foot on the brake pedal thinking what is it what is it that's keeping my foot on that brake pedal what is it that's keeping that person from just hitting the gas and randomly running me over you know is it is it the red light or is it is it something in that individual that respects what the red light means or in the absence of a red light what would it mean for someone to simply not want to plow through a crosswalk full of pedestrians. Um, I think of that as dharma. You know, it it to me it links to something that is particularly Indian in in the way time is conceived uh, in these yugas, these ages. You know, and um, it's it's seen as um, dharma sort of waning a little bit in each of the successive ages. And, of course, the one we're now supposed to be the final and uh, darkest of the ages, which is why it's called the Kali Yuga, um, where uh, Dharma uh, has the hardest time shining through. And people think it gets really bad now. I think people think it is really bad now. But, you know, I tell them, look, it gets really bad when people simply don't keep their foot on the brake pedal at the crosswalk. Um, there's a lot of things we do in our lives that are dharmic because we can't conceive of doing them any other way unless we're a really, really um, troubled individual. Um, so it's, it's kind of the glue that, that, that holds things together on an individual and societal level. And as far as what I see my role as being, um, it's in some way it's having thoughts like that and <laughs> sharing them and, uh, trying to take some of these timeless teachings and putting them in, in, in a very practical sort of context, as, as I just did, like I just shared, and as my teacher, Desikachar, was always doing. He was, he was never not coming from a teaching when he was talking to you. You might not know which teaching it was, and he may not tell you, but eventually it would dawn on you he was talking about this or that teaching through the very sort of real-life practical um, examples and stories that he would give so Mm. that's the best way i can think of opening with that that's a that's a powerful opener and this is an interesting thought experiment um to conceptualize dharma Uh, let me see if i can pick apart and um unpack what you said this idea of 
keeping our foot on the brake pedal when someone else's <laughs> life is on the on the line. You know, most of us who drive cars or in a similar situation, we actually don't consciously weigh the two options there. Do I want to run this person over? It, in fact, it's something that's deeply embedded in our decision-making process so much that it's a subconscious decision that already happens. Ooh. Is that what you're getting at by Dharma being something that is a glue holding together the fabric of society? Uh, yeah, uh, I would say. And a good way to understand any concept you're trying to, to conceptualize is to imagine what it would be like in the absence of that. Mm. Um, and sometimes that shows you what something really is when it's so ubiquitous in our lives. And, and I want to point out that, you know, when I have my foot on, on the brake at the crosswalk, um, it's, it's perhaps not even primarily out of consideration for the pedestrians in the cross, crosswalk. It's, it's for myself, uh, as well. I mean, you know, I mean, I may have a very angry, day going, you know, and I may be really trying to get somewhere and I may view these people in the crosswalk as, as being in my way and I may feel <laughs> anger towards them and, and feel an impulse to just plow through that red light and plow through the crosswalk. Um, even if some very primitive atavistic part of me feels that, that they deserve it, you know, it just would be terribly inconvenient for me if I did that. Um, and, right. you know, so there's a, there's a sense of, of self-preservation implied in this concept of dharma as well, is, is the impulse to keep our own lives intact and, and, and going, which, which does extend to other, other people, certainly. But sometimes they're not really the primary beneficiary of this dharmic way of being. Uh, if you think about it, you know, if you really boil down to what it would really mean to be without this impulse. Right. So it's not so much about something inherent to the selflessness of our behaviors so much as just that there are motivations, more fundamentally speaking, at all guiding our decisions. And oh, absolutely. And there's self-preservation, there's yeah. preservation of the collective health, and yeah. maybe any number of other complicating factors. Yeah, well, frankly, I really don't trust people who claim to be acting out of purely selfless motives. Um, all the people I've met in my life who, who are proclaiming that that's where they're coming from have been found to be deeply untrustworthy. Mm. Yeah. And, and even when one is, let's say theoretically, that someone is motivated entirely selflessly, they're still going to benefit from, in, in the way of reputation at the very least. Well, now we're getting into some philosophy that's not exclusively Indian. I mean, if, if, you, if, you, if you read any Kant, for example, uh, and, you know, um, good luck with, you know, parsing it. But um, his definition of a truly virtuous act even excluded the benefit one could get for, one, for one's own self-esteem in being selfless. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so it's in a true negation of, of the self uh, as an ultimate value in his version of virtue, which, by the way, unless you haven't guessed, I fundamentally disagree with. But, um, you know, the uh, idea that you could claim to be virtuous uh, in some sort of ego gratification sense by acting selflessly is something he takes off the board as, as, as being virtuous. So, you know, he kind of puts you in a, in a, in a bind there. Which yeah. Is, that's a bit of a paradox. <laughs> it, it is. Unless and you know, you're the <laughs> sort of person who derives no pleasure from the, from the happiness of others. Yeah. Well, and that's the kind of person who derives some pleasure in not being a person at all. Um, it often it often reminds me of the the Mahayana the Mahayana vows uh, that the Buddhists take, where you know you you take this this great vow to delay your own enlightenment until every other sentient being in the universe has achieved their salvation, and that just to me that creates an incredible 
sort of backlog at the gates of eternity where all these Mahayana Buddhists are insisting everyone go first. And it doesn't, it, it never made any sense to me. No, I insist <laughs> you first. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's kind of nuts when you, when you sort of think about it, but you know, you, you get down to really fundamental paradoxes at the bottom of a lot of these philosophies and yeah. your degree to the degree to which you're willing to tolerate Fundamental paradoxes is, is, is the degree to which you're, you're willing to actually buy into a lot of these things. And I've spent a lot of years sort of banishing these contradictions from my own uh, way of thinking. And it was, it was at, at some great cost uh, to some sacred cows, shall we say, and um, things that I really thought I believed in. But, you know, my teacher, to his credit, um, pushed me in that direction. Um, by always turning my questions back on me and, and, and really refusing to give me his personal take or anyone else's philosophy on some really fundamental issues I was wrestling with. And he would always very politely but firmly hand the inquiry back to me by saying something like, well, if this is important for you, then what does your experience tell you about this issue? You know, don't worry about what I say or my father said or Patanjali or, you know, Buddha or Shankaracharya or, or anyone. You know, this, if this is important to you, you need to have an opinion about it. So let's, let's spin the clock back a bit then. How did you come across TKV Desikachar and how did you become a student of his? Well, that goes back to before uh, I met him or really even connected anything of significance to his name. Um, and I often tell this story because I know exactly when I first became aware that he existed. I was at the time serving as the uh, director of the uh, Shivananda yoga community in um, West Hollywood. Um, it was on Sunset Strip, in fact, at the time, the center I was running. And um, I had been transferred there in the spring of 1981 by the Shivananda organization as a brand new, brandly, brandly, brand newly minted Swami um, at the age of 23. And after a while serving there, I met someone who had just gotten back from a tour of India and was opening his own studio out in Marina del Rey. And this person was uh, Larry Payne, uh, who, as you probably know, is one of the co-founders of um, IAYT, the International Association of Yoga Therapists. And he became, over the years, a close associate of uh, Desik Chars. But at that point, he didn't consider himself to be exclusively Desik Chars student. He was been traveling around and sort of checking out the yoga scene in India and had visited all of the major teachers that he could uh, find, including um, Iyengar, and uh, he was in, I believe he went to Mysore and to the Kavalyadham and Lodavla and all these places. And so every place that he mentioned he traveled, I had sort of heard of at that point, except this one guy in Madras. Uh, and I'd never heard the name Desikachar before, and he had been most impressed by Desikachar. And so I asked Larry what was most impressive about him, and he, he said, it's all in the breath. He teaches it's all in the breath. And he didn't say much more than that. I don't know that he knew much more about Desikachar at that point than that, but it's really stuck in my mind. So I remembered that thing about the breath, and I promptly forgot Desikachar's name. So this is 1981, um, and uh, but this thing about breathing stuck in my brain, and I had already been observing the students in the Shivananda yoga classes I was teaching um, in terms of, you know, why could some of them do some poses and not others? And, you know, what were all the different body types and what little tricks could I figure out to help them do some of the poses better? So I was already sort of adapting and modifying uh, the way I was teaching this standardized sequence that, that Shivananda taught, you know, the, the sequence really never changed very much, but the way I was approaching it for the students in class was just out of my observations. And I began observing the breath quite a bit after this thing stuck in my mind about what Larry said. And um, I, I kept on with that 
for many years, even after I left the Shivananda organization and started experimenting with different class sequences. And I, I was really always trying to figure out what's the best way to breathe to get into this or that pose or to do this or that movement without much guidance or structure, because that really wasn't a, a part of the way Shivananda taught asana, except for a salutation, you know, you breathe this way or that way when you're bending forward or backward. And so I had my own sort of stuff worked out by um, 1987 or so. Uh, I was already back in New York. I was no longer working for Shivananda, and I had my own studio by then in the East Village here in in New York. And I read an interview. It was an interview. It was an article that David Frawley had written in Yoga Journal about uh, Gary Kraftso, who is uh, a major uh, student of Desika Char's. And um, Gary was talking about his approach to yoga that he had learned. Uh, he had never studied with anyone other than Desika Char. Uh, and he was talking about the way he was adapting poses for individuals and the way he was using breathing in certain ways. And it was really resonating with me because it was very, very similar to the, some of the stuff I'd arrived at uh, through my own explorations. And then I recognized the name of his teacher, Desika Char, as the guy that Larry had told me about you know, what was it, now six years prior. And I was bound and determined to, to meet Gary and to meet Desika Char, and um, I immediately called the phone number that was listed in this article, which was in Maui, completely forgetting about the time difference between New York and Maui. So mm-hmm. um, I'm sure everyone was asleep over there, and I probably got the studio answering machine. Um, but later that day, Gary's then wife, Mirka, uh, called me back, uh, you know, in response to my inquiry. And it was not practical for me to go to Maui and study with him, but Gary was going to be presenting at uh, um, a conference I'd never heard of uh, called Unity in Yoga, uh, which was happening um, early in 1988 in California. And so I lo- found out that information, looked it up, signed up with the intention of meeting Gary and finding everything out I could from him about his way of teaching and the breathing and all of that. And so that's when I attended my first uh, Unity and Yoga conference. And I eventually got very involved in that organization, became the vice president. And that's another part of my story, you know, of being part of organizing yoga events and all of the discussions leading up to the standards that eventually were adopted by the Alliance, which is actually what Unity and Yoga turned into. Um, but into yoga Alliance. Yeah. Yoga Alliance. Oh, used, okay. it, it took over the nonprofit status of what was then a dormant unity in yoga, which really had no, um, mission at that point, uh, because yoga journal had started producing conferences, um, which is the main thing that unity and yoga had been doing up until 1994. The first, um, yoga journal conference was 1995. So there was a few fallow years there for Unity and Yoga, and eventually, um, when the when we came up with the standards, uh, and people wanted to create an organization to administer them, uh, it was just very convenient to do a name change on the five hundred one c three sort of mm. nonprofit that was that had been Unity and Yoga. But anyway, back to Gary. I I you know took all of the classes he was teaching. After class, I asked a lot of annoying questions and, um, you know, made a nice connection with him. And he told me about this seminar that Desk was teaching later that summer, in the summer of 88, um, at Colgate University in upstate New York. Um, and uh, I immediately signed up for that and tried to sign up for the week after the public seminar, which was a closed session with um, hand-selected people for what was going to be a Vini Yoga uh, certification program that was just starting to form that year. And I, I knew without any uncertainty that I needed to be in that program. And um, I didn't get in to the second week because there was limited registration and all the people in the selection committee were senior students of Desi Guitar and they all had their own students who they knew who got in and no one knew who I was. And that's a whole other aspect of the story, how I eventually got in there. But that's when I met Desi Char. It's a long lead up to answer your question, but it's a lot of my history. And um, that was the, so it was the summer of 1988. And I didn't officially become a student really formally until the following year in 1989, when I had my first uh, one-on-one uh, private um, 
uh, interview with him. Uh, okay. I, count, I counted from 1988 because uh, that's when my whole worldview of yoga and breathing got absolutely and quite literally turned upside down and broken apart. And it took me about six months to even be able to breathe properly after that. Yeah, yeah, wow. So at this point, you had already been, you were chin deep in yoga. You owned a yoga studio. You had been on the on the board or the vice president of this um, conference mm-hmm. yeah. organization. Mm-hmm. How could you be so certain that this would be someone who would be a positive influence on your teaching without having met him at all? What about it really captivated you? You, you mentioned... Gary talking about adapting poses to uh-huh. people's different body types. You mentioned the um, to the mystery around it being all around the breath. Mm-hmm. What was it that captivated you? And then what did you find when you actually did have the opportunity to study under Desika Char? Um, well, the first thing that, that I connected with, as I mentioned, was the way um, Gary's description of how he had learned to teach resonated with what I had arrived at on my own with actually no guidance, you know, uh, at all. Um, and so it occurred to me, I didn't need to keep reinventing the wheel, that there were people that had been working on the same exact sorts of issues I was interested in, uh, for mm-hmm. many, many years. And, you know, there was a tradition that went back, uh, to Krishnamacharya, who the world was just beginning to learn about back then, um, outside of the circles that already knew his significance. Um, and so the idea of being reconnected with a teaching tradition, um, that was focused on the same things that I valued was very, very powerful. And then there was just meeting and hearing and seeing Desigachar. Um, it, it, he had a tremendous impact on, on me, uh, at that point in my life, uh, because I was ready on some level to sort of shake loose of the original, um, I would say, context of my yoga, which was very ashram based. It was taught by swamis. It was brought to the West by a swami who trained with a swami. Um, And who ordained you a swami? uh, Swami Vishnudevananda. There Um, you go. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and by the way, again, at this time in history right now, he, he and his organization are coming under the kind of scrutiny a lot of organizations have been. And at the time, I had absolutely no inkling about him and his proclivities and all of that. Um, I was too busy breaking my own vows to worry about what he was doing with his, frankly. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, <laughs> um, but the, you see, the, 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 the reason I'm mentioning that is that Desikachar, his father, his father's teacher, were all householders, you know. And if you look at the, all of the, the, the teachers that come out of that lineage, this is not a lineage of swamis or renunciates. These are people who live in the world, who have families, who, who you know, they have to earn a living. They, they're not off in a cave somewhere uh, talking about these sort of um, lofty Vedantic goals for their, their yoga you know, his interpretations of the teachings with which I was already familiar were very, very different, very this worldly. Um, and at that time in my life, um, I was just beginning to, you know, uh, have a family and a marriage and, um, you know, thinking of having children. I have th- three boys now who are uh, 30, 25, and 20. Um, and so I was, you know, I had tried to skip all of that by becoming a a swami at the age of 23. You know, I thought I knew myself well enough to know that, I thought I knew the world well enough to know that I didn't want any more of it. It was actually mostly myself I didn't want more of at that point, but, you know, that's 2020, is, hindsight is 2020. Um, so, you know, it was it, was, it all coincided with, with the way my life was going and the, um, the practicality of the teachings and just the, the sweetness with which Desika Char uh, treated me. Um, at this point, we were interacting mainly, you know, in the group sessions with, I was, 
raising my hand and asking questions, and he was answering. And we had a few little exchanges uh, in between sessions, because at that point I was trying to get into this next week, uh, the, the the training, the Vinny Yoga training, which had been closed. And 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 so Gary Kraftsau and Larry Payne, who were both there, uh, did intercede on my behalf and told Desika Char that I was sincere, even though no one knew who I was. And, all of that, and they did tell him a little bit about my background. I mean, Larry was a friend at that point. Gary, I barely knew, but uh, Larry told him a little bit about my background with Shivananda and the fact that I had been a Swami and all of that. And so he kind of knew all this about me, and and so um, he he uh, you know treated me um, with that knowledge and in that in that context. And I, I know that I was, I, I kind of had a chip on my shoulder. I was trying to prove, you know, you know how you're in a room sometimes and there's a person that's asking questions that are really only designed to demonstrate their knowledge of the issue. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. that was well, you. That was, that was me. That was, I was, that, <laughs> I, I was definitely that asshole that week because I want, you know, I wanted, I wanted to say like, hey, I belong here and I need to be in this next week. That mm-hmm. I was that I was rejected from, and yeah. he, he was very very kind about that, you know. And he 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 could have you know sort of put me down in public and you know like rolled his eyes or what I, like like I would have been tempted to do if someone was doing that to me when I was teaching, um, but he he didn't. And um, he did you know he did ask me a question now that I recall because it, it, I'm reminded of your your question about Dharma that we opened with. Mm-hmm. Um, and he, and this wasn't during one of the group sessions, it was afterwards we had a chance to interact a bit, and he said, so this idea of shraddha, how would you define shraddha, right? And so shraddha, as many people know, is r- roughly translated as, as faith, or the force of faith that someone has. And not being a person of faith, being an, an, an atheist, you know, I... Um, you know, don't really express things in those terms. But I had been giving it some thought because it had been sort of a part of some of the themes he was talking about during that week. And I I thought for a moment, I said, sir, I think I would understand Shraddha as um, a willingness to surrender to Dharma. And he kind of took that in and he he saw that I had been giving it some thought. And I don't know if, if, if it, he was expecting anything like that. I didn't, wasn't expecting to say it. But on some level, it connected with him, and I think it impressed him a bit that I was giving some original thought to the things that he'd, he had been saying. And um, that was sort of the, the beginning, now that I think of it, of the, the kinds of exchanges we would have over the years Mm -hmm. yeah that was one of the first times that he was not tempted to roll his eyes but in fact saw you with some respect maybe well i don't know (laughs) if he was ever tempted to roll his eyes i was projecting you know what i would have done to someone like me he he wasn't an eye roller at all he was very respectful and and he was asked some truly stupid questions um in in public uh discourses that that i had seen and, and he he always <laughs> managed to maintain his cool um uh, mm-hmm. which was very impressive considering you know um some of the stuff that got thrown at him um so yeah he was he was like a ninja that way he was very very good at it so to go back to your personal connection to him i, I think it makes total sense mm-hmm. that as a young person you were attracted to yoga as sort of a, an escape from the burden of responsibility mm-hmm. in our everyday householder <laughs> life i think that's quite common and a lot of people who go to yoga are kind of rebellious in nature in that way but mm-hmm. it was a natural evolution of your process to look for a teacher who who had the background that you were kind of stepping into as a family man, perhaps, or someone who saw yourself going in that direction. Well, well, sure, what did yeah. it? What What did it effectively look like for a teacher to come from that place versus what you had experienced before in the Shivananda lineage? Mm-hmm. What did it look like? Like, how did my practice change? How did my uh, body More, change? Uh, sure. How did my breathing change? You're welcome to answer from the perspective of your practice, but really what I was asking is how did he show up differently as a teacher that stuck uh, out to you? 
Mm. Well, he wasn't a guru, for sure. And he wouldn't tolerate people um, trying to turn him into one. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, he likes to tell the story about um, when he was first, first sent out of India by his father on a teaching assignment. It was to teach J. Krishnamurti, um, who had received some asana instruction from uh, Iyengar years before. But as his body aged, he developed some problems and the practice was no longer appropriate for him. And he wrote to Krishnamacharya uh, asking for some help. And Krishnamacharya sent his son to Switzerland, where uh, Krishnamurti was. And um, as his, his, this adapted practice that Desikachar taught him was starting to work, and he took out some of these things that were inappropriate for him to do. His health improved. He started to ask lots of questions about yoga, and Deskachar shared what he had learned from his father. And they developed quite a close relationship. And he likes to tell this story about how at one point uh, Krishnamurti said to him, Sir, please do me one favor. Never become a guru. Mm. <laughs> now, Never. Don't based do on, it. Based on what we know of Krishnamurti's history, that's quite a bit of advice to give somebody because <laughs> he was supposed to be the world teacher and he walked away from it, you know? Um, so he heeded the advice. He did as best he could in spite mm. of people's best efforts to turn him into one and to, to hang their projections on him. So I had already sort of been through that. Although I never, even in my Shivananda days with Swami Vishnu, I mean, as much as his, some of the people around him, wanted to turn him into this, you know, uh, sort of divine or transcendent figure. I mean, he, as a personality, he, he kind of defied that because he was very, as we could say, rajasic. You know, he had a temper on him. Mm -hmm. and, and he had a lot of personality, had a lot of charisma, but he was obviously a very human human being with all of the, the foibles and flaws. And as we are now learning, um, the dark side that every human being has. Um, and I never took him seriously as one of these godlike sort of gurus or teachers. And that suited me just fine. You know, I never bought into this guru worship thing ever, mm -hmm. even in the deepest days of my ashram existence. Um, and I always kind of stood a little bit apart from it. Um, and, I never fully believed in this whole enlightenment thing, you know. I mean, back to the Buddhist at the gate of eternity, you know, um, part of the questioning I, I was involved in from the very beginning was like, oh, wait a minute, so we do all this sadhana. I don't know if you've ever seen Shivananda's book, Sadhana. It's very thick. Yes, um, I've seen okay. it. I have not read the whole thing, but well, I've flipped. Don't bother, don't bother. Okay. I mean, you can flip and see that, like, if you took, <laughs> if you took all of his strong recommendations for what you must be practicing in order to have a spiritual life. First of all, you wouldn't have time to eat or pee um, yeah. or poop. Um, well, if you didn't eat, you wouldn't have to pee or poop. But the point is, you wouldn't have time for anything else. And, and, and so at the end of all of this, though, what they tell you is your ultimate reward is to cease to exist, that your Atman merges, the wave of your Atman merges with the sea of Brahman and you become one with everything and your own individual existence absolutely ceases to be. And it's like, what? wait, what? You do all this stuff and the, oh, the bliss you experience is just, you don't get attached to that because that's a trap. This ultimate pleasure is like, no, that's not your goal. It's to just not be. And I'm like, screw that. That doesn't make any sense to me. Like, and I don't so, want to work toward that. Yeah. No, like what? Toward, ev that, toward evaporation. That, that's your goal? No. Yeah. And, and so I, I, I always was very <laughs> skeptical of some of these things and, and didn't like, you know, drink all of that Kool-Aid, which I'm told is a bad thing to say because it, it, it basically triggers people who are, part of the Jim Jones thing. I don't know. Yeah. You can't say yeah. very much these days about anything without triggering someone. Okay, we strike um, we strike that metaphor from the record. No, keep it in. I just, you know, <laughs> I don't have a problem with it. Some people have a problem with it. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, so, you know, I, I, it's not like I was this bliss bunny just sitting there 
trying to merge my Atman with Brahman and, you know, worshiping Swami Vishnu as some sort of divinely enlightened being. He was clearly not, and, you know, um, I was learning a lot um, about a lot of things and, and really um, for every bit of free labor that I put into that organization, I got much more back out of it. Um, I don't, I don't, you know, regret any amount of time I spent um, working with and and for them at all, um, and yet there there was when I met Desikachar, the distinction between the context of those teachings and what he was teaching was very very clear, and he was explicitly clear about that. I mean, he was very clear about the distinction between the yoga and Hinduism. He's not one of these teachers who's, who would teach it's only authentic yoga if it's Hindu. In fact, he would say that's the opposite happens to be true. These are different darshanas. They are based mm -hmm. on different metaphysical principles. The arguments that each of these systems gives explicitly refutes the arguments of the other systems, which is true for all the darshanas, by the way. And so if you want to respect the tradition, you have to understand the, that, that these are different things. And he was always talking about how there had been this intermixture between uh, the Vedanta and the um, Hinduism and the yoga in the way it had been presented in the West by these swamis who had been coming over ever since the time of uh, uh, Vivekananda. So, um, you know, that really resonated for me. And I had to clear up a lot of this sort of muddled thinking I'd acquired along the way, you know, where we were using terms like jiva and atman um, interchangeably, which they are not, you know, and um, ahamkara, you know, as ego, it's like, well, that doesn't even show up in the Yoga Sutra. So mm -hmm. what does Patanjali say about the ego? Not very much, it turns out, you know. So there's these were ongoing conversations uh, with Desikachar, and he was very, very committed to having clarity on issues like that. Okay, this is, yeah, this is very interesting stuff. So what then does become your, if you've rejected some some goals that were outlined to you by previous oh. teachers, what then becomes your goal and motivation oh. for continuing to practice and, and then also to share oh. the practice? Mm. Yeah, that was, that was at the center of one of the most interesting exchanges I ever had with Desikachar. I was actually interviewing him uh, when I was in India in um, 1992, and um, I was still serving on um, Unity in Yoga then, and we had, we were in the process at that point of organizing for our biggest conference ever, which was to be held in 1993, which would have been the 100th anniversary of yoga in America, because Vivekananda had come in 1893 to the World Parliament of Religions, Chicago, blah, 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 right? So we had, were marking this as the century of yoga in America. And uh, I was tasked while I was there to invite him as one of our keynote presenters, and he politely refused. He, he had other things to do, wasn't interested, whatever, but he said, we can talk, we can have a conversation. And so I had a tape recorder and recorded it, and it turned out to be a very, very uh, sort of pivotal conversation um, I had with him, and uh, I can give you a link to it if you want to. It's still on my um, blog. Yeah, um, that would be great, and we'll make yeah. sure to include it in the show notes from this podcast. Great, yeah, and so I think people would really enjoy it. Um, and so at a certain point in the conversation, he was emphasizing this idea that uh, dukkha, that the recognition of dukkha had to be at the foundation of a person's interest in pursuing yoga. Um, unless there's the recognition that we're suffering in some way, that we're obstructed, that our space is obstructed, because that's all dukkha means, is bad space. Um, there can be no motivation uh, or drive to pursue or practice yoga. And so there was something in me that was really having a problem with this, and it was based on the teachings I'd received in my ashram days, that that suffering is not fundamental to our condition. Um, remember, this wasn't Buddhist teaching. This was, you know, uh, this idea that our a true essential nature is bliss, is ananda, which is exactly the opposite of um, 
of dukkha, of suffering. And so when he said that, something sort of rebelled in me. And I said, but, but suffering can't be our, our fundamental condition, because that's what I thought I heard him saying. And he wasn't actually saying that. He wasn't saying suffering is our fundamental condition. He said it has to be, the recognition of suffering has to be the fundamental um, uh, thing we, we, we recognize as motivating us to practice yoga. But I heard that he was contradicting my cherished teaching that we are at our core bliss. Mm -hmm. And so I, I responded, or I reacted actually, by saying, but, but that's Suffering is not fundamental. Isn't our true nature something like bliss? And he he actually cut in, in you know, in the audio which I transcribed for the interview. He actually cut me off and said, "No, <laughs> that is not that is not a useful idea." Okay, people come to us for help because they are suffering. And he gave me an analogy that has really stuck with me, and it was this. He said to me. If you find a man who has come to you for help and he tells you he is suffering because he cannot find his house, he knows he has a house, he has lived in it before, but now he cannot find it and he is suffering, what do you do to help him? Do you tell him your house has a pot of gold buried under it? Is that what you tell him to help him? You'll make him suffer more. Help him find mm -hmm. his house. Help him find his house. Help him live in his house. And he'll have less suffering. Then you can explore whether there's gold there or not. But that's uh, not how you should come at people, he was saying. He does yoga therapy. He helps people who are suffering. And that's what I was there to learn from him. Now, that really stopped me in my tracks and got me to really think hard about some of the things I had been saying to people over the years, which probably, with all the best intentions, nevertheless made them suffer more mm -hmm. by installing this sort of Vedantic ideal. You know, it's like, oh, there's a part of you that's not suffering. It's like, well, screw that, you know, help me breathe better. Yeah. Uh, help, help me be in less pain. That's what they really need. And it turns out that he was actually referring to some specific teachings when he said that, because the, 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 the metaphor of living in one's house is really about having one's prana fully inhabit the physical body. There's this idea that people in a state of ill health who are suffering have some of their prana actually leaking outside their physical body. It's not all inside of them. And the, the practices of breath, the very simple things we do with people with the breath and the movement is, is about getting them to live in their house, getting the prana back inside. And I'm sure that that was part of what allowed him to form that metaphor for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a bit like, um, it's like a modern, or the modern equivalent might be seeing someone who's going through a depressive episode and telling them, oh, why are you sad? You have so much to be grateful for. Or you shouldn't be sad. There's It's not a big deal. Just Just cheer up. Yeah, people like to call that sort of thing spiritual bypassing, I guess. Spiritual bypassing, yeah. And one could argue that that's what I was doing when I took vows of sannyas at age 22, you know, in India. Or what was I, 23? No, I was 22. I had not yet turned 23. Yeah, so, right. <laughs> You're spiritually bypassing yourself. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, according <laughs> according to the tradition, that's exactly what you're doing. That is you're one skipping, is meant to do. Well, you're skipping two of the ashramas. You're going from brahmacharya uh, to sannyas, uh, to sannyasa, and you're skipping, you know, grahasta and vanaprastya. You're skipping having a family, and then retiring from having a family, and then abandoning your worldly duties. You know, you, that's what that's why it, sannyas is the final stage of life after you've lived a life, and you know. How, how, how many mm -hmm. people are really ready for that sort of thing at, at any age, let alone 22? What a what an idiot. Anyway, you know, hindsight. But I, you know, again, hindsight. I would not, hindsight. I would not give up the lessons learned, really. I mean, if I could talk to myself with what I know now, at age 22, I might have a few things to say, and definitely some things to avoid. But, you know, I, I it's, I wouldn't be the person I am now if I hadn't made the mistakes I've, I've made. And trust me, there were a lot of them. I, I'm just very grateful when I was making those mistakes in my 20s, there was no such thing as the internet. Oh, geez. 
<laughs> to expose your mistakes. These days, oh my goodness. Uh, to have people hunting them down and exposing them uh, for you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it's really, <laughs> yeah. Well, everything happens in at the, at the right time. I guess you are on your own path. Well, I don't know how it, to, to, how it could be any other way. It right. can't be on anyone else's. Jessica Char taught a whole seminar on that in Belgium once that I attended. It was on Svadharma, to get back to the Dharma thing. Mm -hmm. There's a passage in the Gita that says something like, you know, far better is it to do your own Dharma poorly than to do somebody else's well. And so he took that right, one right. shloka as a theme for the entire week. And he, he, he really had us in this deep inquiry about like, why, why are all you Westerners interested in yoga? Why do you want to learn Vedic chanting? Why do you want to go and like take spiritual names or, you know, wear these different clothes or come to my country? You know, he, he really, he didn't take any of that for granted. He had us all deeply inquiring what we were on about, you know, and he, he had us doing things like, you know, like, what tradition are you from? Where's a chant from your tradition? He had Sonia Nelson and me chanting in Hebrew in front of everybody, because we were like the token Jews at that point, I guess. But, you know, <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, my Sanskrit has always sounded a little Jewish when I'm chanting and my... <laughs> my and I suppose, um, um, I, 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 I suspect my Haftorah sounded a little Indian even back then. Who knows? Some scars, right? Yeah, yeah. It's all, <laughs> it's all influencing it's each other. Yeah. <laughs> well, I want to make sure that we get a chance to talk about some of your more recent uh, undertakings. Cool. You've sort of become the leading expert in yoga anatomy. You, you literally wrote the book on it, and many people... Oh, I, I would... I would I, I would not capitalize myself <laughs> that way. I'm sorry. Okay. It's very generous of you, but it's highly inaccurate. The person okay. I wrote the book with, Amy Matthews, is a far greater expert on the minutia of anatomy than I could ever be. And I have learned from people that are far greater anatomists than I would ever, would ever take the trouble to become. Um, I'm more of a compiler and an organizer and a sorting out of big picture issues. And that is a strength of mine for sure. But mm -hmm. the minutia, the detail, all of that, I, I leave that to someone like Amy Matthews because she's quite brilliant at that. So thank you for that, you know, wonderful description. But, um, it, you know, I'm, I, my name is on the book for sure. And I made the thing happen and I put it together and, you know, helped get everything assembled but a lot of the hardcore analysis that's in that book is 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 amy's work so i just want to give credit where credit is rightly due on that one well fair enough okay. and, and and still um many teachers and teacher trainers defer to you and your team including mm -hmm. amy um, yep. to instruct their their teachers on this important piece of the puzzle when you're going mm -hmm. to be a yoga teacher or yoga therapist mm. so my question for you is how does a more medical or Western approach to anatomy mm. inform the way that you handle yoga therapy now? I, I understand mm. that yoga therapy is something that you really, or the individualized presentation of yoga mm. based on the student or patient is something that you mm. picked up from Desika Char, but how has mm. it evolved over time? Well, my studies in what we could call Western anatomy, um, and if there is such a thing, it, it's only in the tools we use and how we hold them when we're taking things apart. You know, um, anatomy is always taking something apart. That's what the word itself means. It means to cut up or cut into, because mm -hmm. a, a tome is a sharp instrument. Um, we we have anatomies in 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 yoga as well, and we have sharp instruments. It, they're just not actual sharp knives and scalpels and saws and things. It's the sharp instrument of the mind, the inner instrument, the consciousness, which can penetrate into our inner experience in various ways. And so that gives you stories of things like chakras and nadis and, um, you know, prana and, and things like that. And the stories we get from what we're calling Western anatomy are stories of, you know, bones and muscles and nerves and, and uh, parts, essentially, because, you know, when you put a sharp physical instrument in something, it parts it, and you have now separated what was not separate in life. And so the stories we tell with anatomy, whether it's Western or um, yogic or traditional Chinese or Tibetan or, you know, any of these systems, um, 
they are always for a purpose, you know, and one of the great validations, I, I could say, of the perspective that Desika Char and I uh, share is this absolute respect for the individual. You, you can't go about a cadaver dissection without noticing right away how absolutely unique each and every person's structure is. Not just from one person to another, but from one side of the body to another, you know. And when you start looking at the mechanics of individual motion and structure, you see that right away. That's what I was picking up on in my early days with Shivananda, watching all these different bodies trying to do the same postures over and over again. Um, you know, there's people doing incredible work on that these days, people who know a lot more anatomy and science than, than I do, like Bernie Clark, for example, who, um, you know, uh, has been writing marvelous books about your body, your yoga, your spine, your yoga, you know. He's still producing books that, that really do show the, the, in great detail, the anatomical differences that are very significant in terms of what we can and cannot do in things like yoga postures. So that is that individual perspective is absolutely reinforced the minute you start looking with any kind of clarity at the differences in people's in people's bodies and that was something that really opened my eyes actually when i did my first cadaver lab with gil headley who's become a good friend of mine uh, another master anatomist and just amazing human being um what I became disabused of right away was this idealized image of so-called normal anatomy that I had learned from looking at books, which were basically paintings, artwork mm -hmm. that was being yeah. rendered of the human form. And I had that in my head as I was dissecting and things really didn't match up. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> um, but it, it was more than that. There was something deeply conceptual that I had wrong. See, I, I, I knew that people's bodies were different, but I thought they differed from the norm. Right, like everyone is some sort of deviation from a standard form. Right, which, which uh -huh. and there is no such thing as a standard form. Right. It doesn't exist. What's, what, see, we are all different, not from a norm. It's difference that is the norm. Mm -hmm. That was an earth-shattering conceptual shift for me to stop comparing things to a norm because that influences how you teach something like asana. Yeah. You know, like, do I hold in my head that there, this form, this pose has an ideal shape somewhere, somewhere in Plato's world of forms, maybe, you know, mm -hmm. see, so there's that, there's that, there's a mistaken philosophy there. You know, there's a state, there's a mistaken epistemology in metaphysics behind that idea that there is some ideal form from which we derive our concepts. And I was being very platonic, very intrinsic about the way I was teaching asana because I thought there was an ideal form. And you can certainly get that image in your head or that idea in your head from looking at books and drawings or descriptions or whatever of how it should be. Well, you know, not every, everybody's body can do that. Mm -hmm. You know, Iyengar's body couldn't do every pose that he put in light on yoga. <laughs> Yeah. You know, no, there's pictures of him actually not doing the full version of poses in light on yoga, you know, because he had a very specific body. Yeah, you know, everyone does. Nobody's body can do all the poses. And so it, it was really sort of a seismic philosophical shift as much as anything. Right. And, was, and even if people yeah. do do the poses, like one person's will look quite different from another's, even if both are, quote unquote, advanced or full. Absolutely. And, and they'll mm -hmm. feel very different to them and from in, in the same person from one day to another in the same pose. You know, we're, we're experimenting yeah. in a lab that's constantly changing because our body is aging. I can't practice asana now the way I did in my 20s. I put myself in the emergency room. Not that I'd go to an emergency room these days, but, you know, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it just, you know, it's it's really it forms a main part of the conversation when I go and teach workshops about yoga anatomy because of the way people are trained to teach. You know, they're given a script, they're given an idea, they're given something to say and something to do, and that's how it has to be. 
You know, this was this was always part of the ethos that I had when we were coming up with these 200 and 500 hour standards, by the way. It's like, you know, 200 hours does not make a teacher. It makes an instructor. It's a different animal altogether. You know, an instructor is someone that's been taught to teach a class. They've been given some tools so they can get in front of a room, in front of however many people for however long, and hopefully do something useful and not hurt them. And maybe learn how to become a teacher over time by observing and thinking and, you know, processing and, and metabolizing what they're doing and what they're seeing and what they're saying so that the words eventually come out of your mouth are yours and not somebody else's that are just being regurgitated from one generation of teaching to another. You know, there's a big difference between an instructor and a teacher. And I don't know if you can even quantify it in hours at all, but 200, unless you're already a master teacher of something, and then you apply that to yoga, it doesn't make you a teacher. It couldn't. And nor, mm. should, it, nor should we lead people to think that it could. Yoga and 200 hour yoga instructor training. How about that for a new semantic uh, well, take? I, well, I've been pushing the RYI thing for as long as I can remember. Not that the Alliance is going to change the T to an I at the 200 hour level, but they have acknowledged, I think they're calling it foundational now or something, you know. Um, but uh, it should just be explicitly clear within the trainings and the standards that, you know, this is an entry level thing that gets you on the stage where you can learn how to become a teacher. I would just have preferred clarity between the two terms from the beginning, which we didn't have. But, you know, we could have done a lot of things differently with the Alliance. <laughs> mm -hmm. So thank you for sharing your uh, your sense of this this realization that you had around understanding that there's no default body type and how that completely changed your approach to mm. teaching and understanding anatomy. I was going to ask you about a common misconception that you see among yoga teachers, but I feel mm. like that's it. That's a big one. Well, sure. It's sort of the mother of so many of the other misconceptions. Um, and this happens when I'm teaching, you know, someone will ask a specific sort of genus of question, which points to an underlying principle that is being misperceived or, you know, uh, not understood. And so in Desika Char's manner, I'll turn it back on the question and, you know, try to inquire about some of the premises that led to not just that question, but all types of that kind of question, you know, um, and it, it does go back to uh, this fundamental idea that there is this ideal to which we're trying to um, strive or that we're trying to achieve uh, in asana or practice or whatever. And it, it, it relates to the spiritual realm too, what I was saying earlier about ananda, you know, this sort of unattainable you know, state of extreme bliss and, and you know, the extinguishing of your own selfdom as an ultimate goal. Um, you know, there, there's, there's this very sort of otherworldly mystical, uh, way of thinking that goes along with that. And, and that in fact was Plato's explicit, um, epistemology. You know, he said that we, we remember the world of forms from our previous lives when our spirits were there before we come into this, um, this world, which is not perfect and, you know, to which we're. Uh, from which we're always trying to uh, at least escape in some way to this perfected realm, you know, the whole mm -hmm. analogy of the cave, the shadows in the cave and all of that. And, you know, uh, in, in a way, some of my studies of Indian philosophy brought me right back to Western philosophy and the sort of eternal struggle between Plato and Aristotle that way, where Aristotle was like, no, it's here. This world is where the uh, origin of our concepts lives, not some other mystical realm. And, you know, um, uh, part of my, what I see as my goal as an educator is to, to show people how some of these, what seem to be very practical questions they're asking about, well, you know, should my knee be here all the time when I'm cueing Virabhadrasana 1 or whatever? And it's like, well, well, okay, you know, is there an ideal place for the knee to be? And it's like, well, whose knee are we talking about? You know, there is no the knee. 
Mm-hmm. You know, it, it goes yeah. to the way people share their experiences in class too, because I'll, you know, I, I, I frequently teach with this very simple method I've devised, which is, which I call try this, now try that, now see what you notice, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's tended to generate uh, a contrast of experience and some feedback, which people share. And so, you know, it'll be as simple as, okay, we're going to lift our arms and breathe this way. Now we're going to lift our arms and breathe the other way, you know, something like that. And when people are sharing their feedback, they very seldom do it in the first person. It's like, well, I noticed that when you lift the arms and, you, and it's like, well, wait a minute, whose arms are you talking about? Yeah, yeah. You didn't right. notice my experience. You noticed yeah, yours. Right. But that's how we talk to our students. Yeah. We, we depersonalize right. the cueing and we use words like the leg. You know, yeah, or that's a very common one. Right, absolutely, and we use it to even describe our own personal experiences that we've just had like thirty seconds ago. And I keep <laughs> pointing this out, and it's like you know, you can, you don't have to necessarily change what you're teaching. Just be aware of how you're using your language. You can say, well, when I do this pose and I hold my knee this way, I feel this. What do you notice if you try it that way? Rather than telling people what they should be feeling. That's a big no-no as far as I'm concerned. You're always leaving people out of something authentic when you're telling them what they should be feeling. Let's not confuse telling them what you want them to be doing in order to keep them safe or to to do the technique with, okay, now you will get that result if you do it the way I tell you, right? Right. So for, good, for me, that's the, con- yeah, that's the contrast to the way I teach. The way I teach, as I said, is try this, now try that, now see what you notice. As opposed to, here's the technique, do it that way, that's what you'll get as a result. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I just don't think that's useful, actually. Right. Okay, and then for people who are interested in having the same experience, potentially, or a similar experience that you did with seeing all the differences in people's anatomy through d- cadaver dissection. I know that you have an event coming up. Can you share a little bit about that? Oh, yes. This is a bucket list item for me. And I think a lot of people, we've been wanting to organize something like this for a while. Yes, I am actually co-leading a cadaver dissection with another very smart uh, female anatomist, my friend Lori Nemitz. Um, who's a wonderful yoga teacher. She's done a lot of work in the lab with people like Gil Headley, as I mentioned, and Tom Myers, and she's part of the Human Plastination Project and, you know, a a big part of the whole fascia research world as well as a wonderful movement and yoga teacher. So she and I are getting together at the end of October in San Diego at a, a wonderful lab that we found, and we're organizing this in conjunction with the Soul of Yoga uh, yoga therapy training program that's run by my good friend Monique Lahner, who lives out there. And we're going to have, um, I think, six tables, I believe, meaning six cadavers, um, probably six people at each table, which you need to get through a week of going through the layers of the body. And what's interesting about this lab is that the cadavers are what we call unfixed, meaning they're not embalmed. So um, they have to be refrigerated, of course, but you get to see the textures and the colors and the movement as close to uh, living tissue as, as you can be in that situation. And so it's really going to be quite an amazing experience. And uh, I can give you a link, of course, for that if people are interested. So thank you for mentioning that. That's a really um, fun project. And, you know, that this... Uh, uh, happening at the end of October, so hopefully everyone will be able to travel freely and congregate. And <laughs> let's hope so. <laughs> I, I hope we're free to move around by then. Yeah, if people have doubts, say, "Hey, I'm just hanging out with you know uh, six six people who possibly can't catch anything I've got uh, for that <laughs> week because they're already dead." That's true. <laughs> yeah, that is true. Okay. Well, with that being said, I think this is the perfect time to start winding things down. Okay. I, I end all of these conversations with what I like to call the prana round. So I'm going to ask you six Uh rapid fire questions. Please answer in minimum one word, maximum one sentence. Okay, Leslie. Okay. Sure. Here we, here we go in one word for this one. Mm. Why do you practice yoga? One word. Um, dharma. 
it's the one you started with. Can't think go. of a better Good. one. Yeah. What is your favorite yoga pose and why? <laughs> Shavasana, no explanation needed. None needed. Okay. Well, okay, no, I'll tell you why. It's the one pose that um, I will learn that I will never lose. Oh, that's nice. That's a good answer. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> what is the single best cue or piece of advice that you've ever received from one of your yoga teachers? Um, hmm. I have to go back to the context of how Desikachar taught me, and I don't know if I'd express it in one word, but if I, if it if it if it had to be one word, it would be inquiry. Okay, yeah, you can you can have more than one word, but I, I like that you're able to distill it down to the essence like that, mm. and I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. Okay. Recommend one book, either modern or ancient for our audience. And of course your own book will be listed in the show notes as well. <laughs> so you can skip that one. <laughs> one, it doesn't have to be a yoga book. No, no. Anything that you think will be valuable to our listeners. Oh, I could say something here that would really piss people off. And I think I'm going to say it. Do it. Atlas Shrugged. You know, you're actually not the first person. <laughs> actually, no. Who was, actually, no, it, was, it wasn't Atlas Drugged. It was the Fountainhead. Okay, from, well, who, else, who said that? One of my friends, a teacher in New York named Rigi Sa. Ah, well, put us in touch. I think we should talk. Okay. okay. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> All right. Next question. Is yoga for everyone? If they're breathing, yeah. So, I mean, yes. One converse. word, yes. Yeah. Well, I will, uh, you know, can it be for everyone? Yes. Is it for everyone? Clearly not. There you go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Final question for you, Leslie. How can our audience get in touch with you and how can we support you in your Dharma? Oh, that's sweet. Um, easiest way is my personal website, uh, which you're actually in the process of redesigning right now. So it should have a nice new look on it soon. My, my partner, Lydia, just rolled her eyes. She's sitting there, and she's the one who does the website. She's like, oh, shit, i got to finish that project. Um, and it's uh, yogaanatomy.org. That's two A's, yogaanatomy.org. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Very good. Well, Leslie, I really appreciate you taking the time to converse with me today. I learned a lot. I'm sure our listeners will learn a lot as well. So thanks again, and um, be safe. Be safe in New York. You too, wherever you are, wherever your listeners are. Be safe, guys, and uh, just keep breathing, just not on other people. Dharma Talkers, I hope you enjoyed listening to that conversation as much as I enjoyed having it. And if you did, please share it. Take a screenshot, share it on Instagram, and tag me, at Henry Wins. I love hearing from you about the conversations that make an impact for you. We have the ability to shape the world through our thoughts, words, and conversation. So let's influence the collective consciousness together. All my gratitude to Rory Wagstaff of Ease of Mind Productions for keeping our audio crisp and operations smooth, and to Patrick Kiebzak of Momentology Music and Art for supplying the powerful soundtrack to these conversations. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and review, and tune in to new episodes of Dharma Talk every Thursday. I'll speak to you next week, and until then, keep living your Dharma. <laughs>